Live, it's the Inside Scoop, Virginia. All the news Virginians want to know. Here's your host, political insider, George Burke. Welcome to Inside Scoop, Virginia tonight. Uh, my guests this evening are Shannon Sullivan, who's a local labor activist, chair of the Fairfax County Democratic Committee's Labor Committee, and a representative of UFCW Local 400, United Food and Commercial Workers. They represent uh, most of the people who serve, your, uh, uh, serve you in the grocery stores across the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, to my right is Brian Scrafford. Uh, he's with the Working Families Win Group, which is uh, the educational fund of the Americans for Democratic Action. Welcome to you both. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of executive privilege and talk about uh, the ADA a little bit. Uh, they've been around for about 60 years. Uh, as a, uh, a, a young man, I was very familiar with the ADA. Uh, one of my personal heroes, uh, father, the late Father Robert Drynan, was the president of the ADA at one point. Uh, Barney Frank's sister, Ann Lewis, uh, who was a big Hillary Clinton advisor, is, uh, was a president of the ADA. Uh, and this Ed Fund, I'll tell you, it strikes me, it's extraordinarily similar uh, to the whole AFL-CIO's Working Families Very agenda. much so. Uh, and uh, they actually have an offshoot of folks who are workers in Virginia as well. Yes. Uh, it's, and they're not actually labor union members, mm -hmm. but they're working families and they participate in this ancillary, I don't know if it's yeah. described as ancillary, but it's a, an offshoot of the mm -hmm. AFL-CIO. An affiliate group called Working America, which looks to organize basically working families that don't have direct union affiliation mm -hmm. with very similar um, issue um, mobilization educating in the community. And uh, for those uh, of our viewers who don't know it, I've uh, I've been a big labor advocate for many, many years. I spent uh, over 15 years assistant to the president of the International Association of Firefighters myself. I was also president of the International Labor Communications Association, which represents all the labor editors and the like of all the labor publications. I was, did that for a number of years. I think I was the longest running president in history. So Brian, tell us a little bit about this organization. It's new to uh, Virginia. It's uh, new to basically your focus is the 11th district. Uh, our focus is uh, primarily the 11th congressional district, but we are we're looking at Northern Virginia as a whole, but with a concentration on on the 11th. And our our big goals are to really uh, kind of get out there, educate both the candidates and the general public about issues that are important to uh, working families, uh, whether that's uh, new health care. Uh, there's a lot of, been a lot of talk about health care and. Uh, especially in the Democratic primary season, there's mm -hmm. a whole lot of talk about should we go to universal health care, should we not, and how can we work with the health care system so that people can uh, really afford their health care. And then also uh, we do cover things like a living wage and for Washington DC that's kind of a unique uh, conversation because Washington DC it costs so much to live where so it's uh, the national minimum wage isn't quite relevant to the DC area because it costs so much more to to live here so that is kind of a one of the things we're going out really talking to people about is what do you want from a living wage or a minimum wage what do you think will work for you and we're also kind of uh, especially in the Prince William uh, County area we've been looking at the foreclosures how that's affecting neighborhoods how that's affecting certain minority groups and, and things like that. And we're really, when you get down to it, we're just about improving the lives of working families, Northern Virginia residents in general, and we're out there to empower people to make sure that they know how they can improve their, their life and society in general. And let's go out and help and see what we can do to, to help everyone. The 11th Congressional District is the wealthiest congressional district in the nation. It's the most highly educated congressional district in the nation. How much more are we going to empower these people? Well, here's the thing. I, as I was telling you a few minutes ago off camera, I just graduated from college. I, I actually just had my last class a few days ago. There's still a lot, there's a lot of people like myself who right after college, they have to face the fact that rent Rent in Nova is extremely high. Healthcare, sometimes it doesn't, 
really kick in until you've been with a job for three months and sometimes you can't even find a job for a while. And mm -hmm. so that one way to empower people is to go after the, the, younger, the younger crowd who might have uh, be do, having a little more struggles on the, the financial end. And then also you can always bring in the parents of those kids and, and, uh, and especially in kind of more of the exurb uh, sort of portion of our district, they, they do, the, a lot of families are struggling to, to pay their rent. And so it's really going out there and, and using examples of the people that are doing well in our, in our district and help them see what's going on with those families and how they can util, utilize their skills to improve their economic situation. Mm -hmm. I think you raise a good point with the college kids. Um, the <clears throat> there was a, my wife saw a piece this morning about my alma mater, University of New Hampshire, that the food bank in, at the University of New Hampshire in Durham was going full swing because you had a lot of yep. students who, you know, their parents can't afford to send them any more money. They only made so much. They got tuition. They got everything else, and their backs are against the wall. You're hearing less and less about students running up credit card debt and the like these days because I don't think they're getting the credit card offers anymore given the, uh, the current economy. Um, let's, uh, one of the issues that the Working Families Win uh, organization is pushing is the employers, Employees Free Choice Act. Uh, Shannon, I know you know a lot about this piece of legislation. Uh, why don't you explain it a little bit for our audience? The Employee Free Choice Act is a bill that actually has um, majority of support in both the House and the Senate. We're waiting for that veto-proof majority in the Senate right now, which we hope to gain in the new election cycle. Um, but what the Employee Free Choice Act will do will allow for um, members that want to be a part of a union. And through polling, we know that a majority of the workers out there, if given the free choice without intimidation or harassment to join a union, would freely do so and willingly do so. So if they were given that opportunity, we're hoping that just through um, their ability, we call it a card check recognition, to sign a card, express their willingness and their desire to have a union representative at their workplace, um, that they would be recognized. Right now, the law allows for that, um, but the traditional method is through an election, um, which tends to be very lengthy, very cumbersome. It often goes through the courts, and uh, there's a lot of other factors that come into, the, come into play that deters from the free choice to be able to have a union re recognized what, at work. I think what you mean is a lot of employers utilize all sorts of tactics to scare yeah. the pants off of people for voting for you. There is the negative aspect. We don't want to dwell on that. There's more so just the length that goes into a campaign. You have both sides of the table that are going to throw everything into it and the people get stuck in the middle. When really it should just be your choice. If you want a collective bargaining agent to work for you, like you pick your lawyer, you pick your doctor, you pick your car insurance salesman, um, you should be able to pick your union to represent you in the workplace. I was in the middle of a <clears throat> fight uh, 35 years ago at a newspaper uh -huh. when we fought to bring the guild in yep. and it was a family-owned newspaper and I had tremendous respect for uh, the folks who ran it but boy oh boy I'll tell you I felt a little <laughs> different about them when the organizing effort was done because they pulled every rabbit they could uh -huh. out of the hat to try and defeat it. Yeah. Brian how, uh, how are you promoting this within Northern Virginia? Uh, well, the big the particularly, and obviously, we're in a right-to-work state where uh, it, uh, it not a particularly union-friendly environment. Although Northern Virginia, I think, is, is and, and there's certain parts of Virginia that yeah. are more union-friendly. But the state as a whole, dating back some time, not this administration or even the previous administration, but the state as a whole has some uh, pretty uh, anti-union measures on the book. Yeah, and, and that is kind of one of the, the things that we knew when we came into Virginia. We, we knew that there, there might be some problems running up against the right to work uh, status of Virginia, but and we knew there was a lot of work to do. So one of the primary methods we're using is the house party method, where we're going out to people who might be friendly to our cause, such as yourself and Shannon, mm -hmm. and say, hey, uh, why don't you invite 10 to 15 of your friends into your home and we can sit down, we can explain what's going on, see what's 
some of your concerns are and when you can really build up support for unionizing and for this making sure that employees have the choice to get what they need out of their employment situation. And while this is a longer process, we've realized that through having the, the rather intimate gatherings in the, the household, a lot of times this is where you're going to build up a lot of strong support for whatever cause you're working on. And so throughout, through these house meetings, we're also getting people who are willing to go to a town hall meeting and maybe express their concern about the Employee Free Choice Act to uh, local representatives and, um, and do other sorts of, of things like writing a letter to the editor. And through this space, we're able to kind of put pressure on elected officials and business owners to make sure that they realize this is something important for us to do. We have a call from Fairfax. We have George from Fairfax. Uh, welcome this evening. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for you guys to comment on. It seems to me that the labor unions have had a, an onslaught, an attack from the media, which for some reason is called the left-wing media. Why they would be uh, attacking the unions, I don't know if they're the left-wing media, but it seems like it stems from the era of um, the actor guy with the monkey. What's his name? Reagan. <laughs> when, when they got rid of the fairness doctrine, when they got rid of the fairness doctrine, everything went... Uh, out of the out of norm out of whack there was no ability for the left-wing movement and we don't have a left-wing movement in this country there isn't one people think there is you have to go hard search hard to find one but what seems to me like a more practical and i don't know why the unions haven't approached it is things like their own hmo systems their own health care systems their own uh, pension systems for their workers wouldn't that seem to uh, t be a, a way to take care of their uh, members and provide those benefits at a reduced cost because you can hire the Pakistani doctors and the Indian doctors for far less than you can here. They're willing to come over and get their visas uh, and get paid at a much lower rate. But the last thing I want to comment on is, is it amazes me in this country what happens with, and one example is the um, Alaskan oil spill. Um, after that, it took how many, what, 28 years before any courts came to any kind of resolution as to what's going to happen. Half the people are probably dead from that. And then you go back a little further and you realize that Exxon Mobil was split up under antitrust laws. Who allowed it to be reunited? If anyone buys Exxon or Mobil gasoline, they're fools. That oil is coming from Saudi. They're supporting the Saudis. The Saudis were the prime people who were behind the attack on 9-11. Why would you do that? Any of those, any comments would be appreciated. We're get, George, we're going to be breaking in a few seconds uh, for a two-minute break, but I'm trying to lodge, uh, make notes on all the different things you talked about, because mm -hmm. I do have answers for them. So, uh, and, and I think you'll probably like to hear some of them. So we will answer after the break. Uh, thank you for calling, and folks, thank you for watching. You're watching Inside Scoop Virginia. My guests today are labor activist Shannon Sullivan, uh, who someday you may see hosting here, and Brian Scrafford of the ADA's uh, Working Families Win organization. She's had more than a dozen fractures. And in the next few years, she faces two major surgeries to strengthen her fragile bones. She's only 10 years old. Most people don't worry about fragile bones until late in life. For those with osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bones are a concern throughout their lifetime. Find out how you can strengthen this child's future. Diabetes is a killer. After I was diagnosed, I didn't feel sick, so I didn't listen to my doctor. Then it struck. I had a heart attack, then a stroke, and I was only 49. Most people with diabetes also have high blood pressure and cholesterol, which can cause severe heart damage. In fact, two out of three people with diabetes die from heart disease or stroke. Don't let diabetes destroy your life. Call for your free diabetes survival guide. Choose to live.
Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Welcome back. Uh, my guests are labor activist Shannon Sullivan and Brian Scrafford of the uh, Working Families Win uh, organization. I want to keep calling it a coalition, but it's not. No, it's not, but uh, I'll, I'll be quick to correct you on that one if you, if you make that. The, uh, I want to uh, respond a little bit to George from Fairfax who called and certainly allow my guests to respond as well. Uh, as far as the media, I was in the media. We tried to put a labor union uh, in our newspaper and failed because of a lot of management coercion. Most uh, or many of the big newspapers, uh, the Post, uh, uh, LA Times and the like, uh, Baltimore Sun have unions, they're CWA based, the Guild mm -hmm. is in those uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, and there are unions in the, um, uh, uh, in the network media as well, but not as much as you think. Over the years, uh, in my dealings with the networks, I've watched them basically get rid of 90% of their unionized television crews. And they now hire freelancers to do most of, much and a lot of their work. Uh, as far as the, um, uh, as far as the uh, media understanding unions, I think one of the problems is that they don't know about unions. Uh, too much of today's generation was were not raised, not didn't understand the history of labor, didn't understand, uh, you know, there's always the, the, the normal refrains, you know, labor brought you the five-day work week, the 40-hour work week, and all the like. Well, I also uh, but there's so much more to it. Though. Well, I think there's also another side of the coin that the media may not understand labor. Labor is falling short in its component and relaying its, uh, a, a new generation of its beliefs you know, that's pertinent to not just the blue collar, but the white collar workers, and in terms that, you know, actually resonate with people in, as you said, more relevant terms. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I mean, the average, there's very little taught about labor, in, even in public yeah. schools. Hardly anything, the history of labor. Um, uh, there's very little in the media about labor, and fewer and fewer children are born to families of labor union mm -hmm. members. And, uh, uh, that's part of the problem, and I, but I fully agree with you that the more they can, and b there are plenty of so-called white-collar technical so. professions uh, that certainly could use unions mm -hmm. right now. And there's a lot of mythology out there about labor that needs still needs to be dispelled, um, and you know, find terms that you know people are able to connect and not have the aggressive terminology of you know we're fighting, we're going to you know, you know have this you know war waged against corporate America. Really, it's just you know standing up for basic rights. One of the things uh, uh, certainly your, uh, your union continues to be very active in the political world and really in, so. the, in the world of organizing. Uh, but a lot of the progress in recent years has been made by the public employee unions. Mm -hmm. uh, my own, the firefighters, but many of the public employee unions have been in the forefront of utilizing politics uh, to, as well as yeah. collective bargaining, like but utilizing politics to make wholesale changes in society mm -hmm. and not just for their own members. Uh, and they're capable of doing that because they are in the public sector and they are dealing with public officials, so to right. speak, yeah. all the time. Uh, as far as ExxonMobil, well, George, ExxonMobil is not, I, 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 people call it an American com company. It's a multinational company. We don't have any more control over them. Uh, well, the United States government doesn't have any more control over them than anybody else does. You know, well, they're, they're beyond the, <laughs> the, the, the sovereign nation structure. And, but on that, I mean, with the rising cost of gas prices, especially in this area where a lot of people are spending like two hours in a day in their commute and burning up gasoline, there, there is going to be a lot more pressure, I think, put on companies like ExxonMobil just because with record profits coming in while everyone else is having to decide, okay, do I buy gas for my car or do I buy the groceries for the week? As more people, more and more people are struggling with that decision, there will be more pressure put on the large oil companies. So while the progress will probably be slower than we want, as prices keep skyrocketing, then you're going to see some pressure and it, we won't get exactly what we want. 
But if we kind of organize and have house meetings and things like that around that issue, and if enough people kind of come back around and say, you know what, this is my kind of bread and butter issue, then, they, then the pressure will be put back on the companies and hopefully something will, will change for the better. <laughs> I wish I uh, could agree with you on that, but the reality of the matter is they just posted another quarter of record profits. Uh, a bunch of them testified before Congress and basically laughed at them a few weeks ago. Right. And they make these excuses. Well, it's not us. It's the speculators. You know, we're doing everything we can. They're, they're, they're pushing uh, Congress and they're pushing the Bush administration to open up additional uh, uh, areas for offshore okay. drilling. Yet they got 68 million acres they haven't even touched yet. Yes, but George, how many people a few months ago knew that there were 68 million acres that weren't being touched? Yes, it's, congratulations. It's, year, it's years <laughs> old. It's years old. I mean, they've right. had these. They've had these leases for years, and they haven't touched them. Right, but I'll be the first to admit. I didn't know they had. The, I mean, I knew they had extra places where they could go drill, but I didn't know until. Mm, couple months ago when this whole debate kind of mm -hmm. sparked up, I didn't know that they had 68 million acres of drilling space that they haven't used. And I hadn't thought about the fact that there's a whole bunch of millions and millions of barrels of, uh, in our oil reserves that aren't being utilized right now. So I think that this debate has kind of made the general public realize that, you know, there are some things that can be done. And Granted, it's not going to happen right away, but if we keep putting the pressure on it and keep having this discussion, down the road, there will be some changes made. Granted, nothing's going to happen like that right overnight. But if we keep kind of talking about it, putting pressure on elected officials and, and leaders in our community, then down the road, something will get done. And so... I think if George from Fairfax was still on the line, he'd say nationalize them. That's what he'd say. Uh, I can tell <laughs> just from his tone of voice. But I mean, he talked about the Exxon Valdez and how many years it mm -hmm. took to reach any kind of resolution in that court case. Plus, whatever they paid was a fraction of what they just made in profits in this quarter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's getting to the level of absurdity. And uh, you know, if you've been following these guys, for, for decades, they're bandits. And they are, they're, they're beyond the law. Uh, they operate as multinational corporations and they pretty much do what they want. And uh, right. they always have done what they want. They've got the product, we need it. Uh, they, if you don't think they played a role in, in the uh, slowdown of the production of, of alternative fuels and the slowdown in the production of electric cars, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it, it's all intertwined. I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist, uh, but the reality of the matter is that, you know, we were having these same debates 25 years ago in the halls of Congress. Right. And now, I mean, actually, this kind of does get down to what the heart of working families win, what we're really at. We, what, there's so many problems like the ExxonMobil, rising gas prices and things like that that are going on. but. People have generally kind of accepted, okay, that's how things happen. But working families win, what we're kind of doing is we're going around working on a neighbor to neighbor issue type thing of saying, okay, we really need to put pressure on people. And if we do it as a united, united front, tons and tons of people getting together. Here in, in Virginia, we're hoping to build a coalition over the next couple months of at least 100 activists, which in the, in the large scheme of thing might be small. But if we have 100 activists writing to people like Senator Webb, Senator Warner, well, he's retiring soon, but the new Senator Warner, hopefully. And uh, I think that's in the bag. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, Brian, if someone were to want to get involved with Working Families Win, what's the appropriate measure? I mean, what level of comfort can people expect? I know there's a, a variety of political activities. What are you looking for as far as activists? Well, there, there's a lot of, lot of different uh, ways to get involved. Uh, one of the, the great things you can do is we do have a, a website that's up. It's, uh, it's www.workingfamilieswin.org. 
and you can go there. They really kind of describe what we're doing in a general mm -hmm. sense. And uh, if you go to the Little Virginia section, there's uh, my contact information is on there. So you can feel free to get in touch with me personally and I'll let you know what's going on. But uh, what also, I mean, the venues, there's the, the house party venue, which can be very comfortable for people because you're in a small group. Um, and, and you're also non-profit. Yes, we, we have little <laughs> snacks, and, uh, and obviously I like the snacks. And you're non-profit, <laughs> so you're not asking for any money up front. Right, and there's everything. no money. And, and if you're uh, maybe a little intimidated about the house party format, because mm -hmm. it is smaller, we are having um, uh, community meetings. We're actually having one on coming up on August 16th okay. at the Centerville uh, Regional Library at 10 a.m. and it's going until noon. And one of the things we're going to be doing there is kind of talking about what we're doing, some of our plans for a kind of direct action come October and November. And also, it gives people an opportunity to really talk about what's on their mind. They can always snag me after the meeting, yeah. tell me what what they really want to focus on if if they're a little intimidated about the talking in front of other people. Mm -hmm. And so there's that, and there will be some. Are there food at those meetings too? Um, there, yes. The George, answer is yes. yes. George, <laughs> if you're coming, there will be food. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's. I mean, what we're all about is making people comfortable and working with a variety of different people in a variety of different venues to really mm -hmm. get people involved. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. You had a meeting, I think, in Lorton. We'll talk about that again. You had a meeting. Like, we, we had we had a meeting in uh, Poet. Poet. Yeah. Anyway, we have to take a break. Uh, my name is George Burke. My guests today are Shannon Sullivan and Brian Scrafford. If you want to give us a call, you can reach us at 571-749-1166, and we shall see you in two minutes. Thanks for watching. A universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact C. Fripp at AOL.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop of Virginia. Welcome back. My guests are Shannon Sullivan. She's a uh, union rep for UFCW Local 400. She's the chair of the Fairfax County Democratic Committee Labor Committee. Uh, Brian Scrafford, who's with uh, Working Families Win. It's an offshoot of the Americans for Democratic Action, uh, an organization that I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, we were talking about a variety of things, and we probably didn't answer all of George's from Fairfax's <laughs> questions, but we can't even remember them all. So we, do the, we did the best we he can. He had some very good points, though. Yes, he did. It's he good did. to see people know what's he's going a, on. He's a true lefty, <laughs> that guy. 
uh, at least, you know, from He, he proved your point yeah. that the 11th Congressional District is very well educated and very politicized. Correct. Uh, let's talk about health care. This is an issue that strikes in the heart of the 11th as well as it strikes in uh, every other congressional district in this nation. There are a lot of middle class and upper middle class families as well as folks who are, you know, struggling, um, whereby the children have no health care. And often one or the other of the parents don't have it. Or, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately in this country, your health care uh, to a great degree is tied to your employer. Mm -hmm. And you lose a job, you get uh, laid off, uh, uh, you get disabled, whatever. Uh, your health care situation can change dramatically overnight. Uh, and then you, when you try to get health care uh, as an individual and you have a pre-existing condition, you're up a creek. Uh, and forget so trying to pay for COBRA, that's just almost a... Uh, correct. <laughs> too difficult. <Sure. laughs> so uh, that's, you know, that, the two areas I think that you guys are going to get the most traction in the 11th mm -hmm. are the Employee Free Choice Act. I think that's something that uh, Jerry Connolly, who's the Democrat running in the 11th, has already uh, said he uh, is supporting. Uh, I believe Jim Moran's already supporting mm -hmm. it as Fair well so. um, and has supported it uh, in, in the House as an incumbent. Uh, but the, this health care thing is tough to get your, your uh, arms around. I mean, I don't think there's a Democrat out there who doesn't believe we've got to do something, but there's a million different proposals. Mm -hmm. And I think that was highlighted by the fact that in the Democratic primary, that the specific debate on who would be covered by whose plan got so much traction. I mean, especially, it kind of seemed like John Edwards was kind of the first one out there. Um, and once he kind of sent his thing out, the, then Clinton and Obama were they're quick to respond. But by the end, when it was just Obama and Clinton left, it was almost like, okay, well, who serves more people by which plan? And I think especially in the Democratic crowd, it's almost gotten down to how do we implement some version of universal health care and what do we mean by universal. And, and that's kind of one of the, the big things that we've been going around and talking to people about is what exactly do you want from the government in regards to the health care situation? It's an extraordinarily complex subject. Uh, there are just so many facets to it. There is no simplistic way to do it. And I don't care what any presidential candidate says, they still got to get it through Congress and they got to get it through, you know, health care has more lobbyists. Health care and the energy industries yeah. have the, and pharmaceuticals, <laughs> I, get, I don't really consider them health care. Those are the three biggest groups of lobbyists on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, you can promote anything as president, but you still got to wind it through Congress, which is hellish. And you've got many well-meaning Democrats, uh, both House and Senate, who disagree on how it should be implemented. Yeah. You know, that's the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and Brian, one thing I like about Working Families Win is they're, tr I believe, trying to give people the tools to ask the right questions to educate themselves mm -hmm. and, you know, pull those responses out of politicians. And I think there was several key points that they were trying to solicit on health care and asking of the politicians. I don't know if there's any of those that you could... Uh, um, um, well, it, one of them was uh, this, that, like George mentioned, not denying coverage to people yeah. because of the pre-existing conditions. And, and that's kind of one of the big things, especially for people my age that are kind of just graduating college, they're, they're out trying to get their first health care uh, on their own. And, and sometimes a lot of people are running into, well, they can't get coverage because they might have such and such a condition. And um, another big thing that we've been focusing on is trying to um, get the, the local representatives kind of concentrated on how can we lower the cost of health care. Um, I mean, the, the universal health care, it's, it's a big thing to tackle, like George was saying, mm -hmm. but there, we can maybe work on taking those baby <coughs> steps to, to lower the cost of things that, uh, of 
healthcare while we're going towards the universal healthcare. And then finally, the kind of the big thing that I've been focusing on when I've been talking to people is having the choice of, of doctors. Um, so if you, if you are just changing your plans because you got a new job or something like that, you don't have to lose that relationship you've had with your family doctor. I, I've, <coughs> I've heard uh, uh, of people who have been with the same job for over 20 years and then had to change jobs for whatever reason and lost that doctor they've been going to for 20 years. So providing for the portability of whatever plan happens to. Right. Yeah, I think that's it. critical. It's just so complex, though. Uh, you know, we have some of the best facilities in the world here, but you pay for them. Yeah. Yep. And uh, do we ration health care? <laughs> you know, I mean, some, mm -hmm. of the, some of the systems that provide universal health care provide for health care rationing. If you're old, you're less apt to have a procedure done than if you're young. You know, there's all sorts of issues that have to be sorted out. Um, and it just strikes me that it's going to be very, very, it needs to be done. And I, you know, I applaud uh, the whole idea of educating the citizenry about it. But the act of getting it done is extraordinarily complex. Right, but it can be done. I mean, if you look at <coughs> us compared to all the other industrial <coughs> nations in the, in the world, we're paying... A, lot more than what they, they mm -hmm. are paying over there. It, and over the last five years, the cost of health care um, has gone up 1,000 times. And so it's, it's not just kind of getting something cha changed immediately. It's kind of the first step is how do we stop the, this enormous rise in cost that's been going on? And once we kind of do that, then we can start working with the leaders in the healthcare industry and in and our elected officials and saying, okay, now how do we get the costs going down to where they are all over the, the rest of the world? <coughs> well, and it sounds the, like Georgia uh, could, could use some mm -hmm. health care. Right. NPR <laughs> just did a piece on, uh, I've had a cold for about a week. <coughs> NPR has done a series on health care around the world, and they just did one on mm -hmm. Switzerland. Switzerland's health care is actually very expensive, uh, and you have to pay for it. Uh, you, you require, like Massachusetts is doing now, uh, Devil Patrick has done it, every, you're required to buy health care. Yeah. Every citizen of Massachusetts, every citizen of Switzerland uh, is required to buy it. And uh, you buy basic health care, and then if you have this particular family they profiled, the daughter had schizophrenia, so they had to buy, I mean, they take pre-existing, but they had to buy another piece yeah. of it. Uh, and then the 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 mother wanted sort of boutique certain boutique services for certain things, so she paid additional money, another hundred and thirty Swiss francs. So she ended up paying they ended up paying about oh I don't know what the value of the Swiss franc is to the dollar now, but it's about the same as the euro. So they end up paying over a thousand a month for it. And some of the other European countries uh, and industrialized countries they have a minimum tax rate of 50% or 55%. Okay. So the government pays for much more because the citizens are paying for it in the tax rate. So it's all interconnected. And uh, I'm a big advocate of universal health care because by not having it, those people who don't have health care who go to the hospital and actually pay fee for service pay much more than I do with my health care or you do with yours because our health insurance companies negotiate discounts and only pay a certain percentage. Uh, and the whole, everybody pays more for health care because of all the folks who can't afford to pay it. I mean, we, you know, at least we, uh, on paper, everybody who walks through the door in a hospital is supposed to be served yeah. and supposed to be Well, there's also the care. fact that those middle working class people that, you know, finally by the time that they're at the doctor's office, it's the emergency room because they mm -hmm. put off all the preventative care because it's just another bill that they can put toward uh, an electric bill or groceries. And so it is a serious event when they finally get to see someone. And that's where you run into a lot of problems. I, I've seen some studies that show it as high as 80% of bankruptcies have to do deal with the fact that they had some major medical expense. Sure. Yeah. And that's why I think a lot of families say, oh, I'm going to put off the doctor visit until I'm really sick. But the problem with that is 
when you're really sick, that can create right. some major problems. And that kind of gets back to the whole the house party and community meeting thing that we're working on is we want to make sure people realize this. And if the, if people realize that shelling out maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars here uh, is going to save you having to spend tens of thousands of dollars later, then that can really help a lot of people. And so that's that's really how we're addressing the healthcare concern because we're not necessarily the medical experts, but we, we can point people in the right direction. And so that's where we, we're really out there kind of letting people know that this is what's happening and this is what could happen if you put the things off. Um, so that's really where we've seen a lot of the progress that have been has mm -hmm. been made so this letting people yeah. know what's going on. There's also the cost saving aspect of, you know, your tax dollars at work, you know, for those that can't afford it. Now don't get me wrong, I want people to seek medical treatment when they need it. Um, but having, you know, access to some health care plan and have that worked into a collective risk to, you know, provide for everyone, you know. Right. And when you hit people in their pocketbooks and their their tax bill, they, they start to pay attention. Or right. the federal government could start by negotiating drug prices with the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. You know, There's a lot of efficiency that can be uh, negotiated. Back on that because of the pharmaceuticals have you know wield so much power in the halls of Congress. Mm -hmm. The uh, I just saw an article the other day about the, uh, one of the country fairs in Southwest Virginia. Uh, they a lot of these fairs, particularly in the more rural areas, provide medical services. You can come in, you know, you pay your five dollars mm -hmm. to get into the fair, and there's a tent where they'll blood check pressure. blood pressure and cholesterol and the like, and do even you know do blood tests. Uh, and people line up, thousands of people line up to do it because it's their only access yeah. to health care. Uh, I think it's going to be a long road to hoe. I've had uh, Judy Fader on this show. Judy's been, is, is one of the nation's foremost experts on health care. Mm -hmm. And she'll be the first to admit that it's, it's, it's going to be very tough. I mean, we have to do something, but it's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no employer under our current system is required to provide any kind of health care and fewer and fewer of them are, are providing it. Yes, mm -hmm. unless you have a labor organization to negotiate your benefits. Yeah. Um, it's one thing that we do take very, very seriously. Um, health care is a, a fundamental part of any of our collective bargaining agreements mm -hmm. and it's very, very pricey. I mean, you have your wages and you can tack on there another ten dollars and uh, that's your health care program. Yeah. And you know, you put that into a collective pool on some national or universal scale, that allows for a lot more monetary issues. Well, time flies when you're having fun. We're going to have to break again for two minutes. Uh, I urge you to stay with us and feel free to call us at 571 749 1166. I suspect we'll talk about health care a little bit more, and now I'll get a chance to call. Thanks for watching. Prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow! Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters. 
collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop of Virginia. Welcome back. My guests today are Brian Scrafford with Working Families Win, which is a, an educational program of the Americans for Democratic Action. I uh, haven't heard much about them in the last few years. Well, they're still around. I'm glad to see it. Uh, Shannon Sullivan, local, local labor activist. She is chair of the uh, FC uh, DC Labor Committee. Uh, she's a representative uh, for UFCW Local 400, and she's going to start uh, working with me and hosting some of these shows as time goes on, and I'm confident she'll do a good job. So bear with me. Oh, I don't think we're going to have to bear with you at all. I think you already got it down pat. Um, basically, what you're talking about here, Brian, is a grassroots organization. Right. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about grassroots these days. Uh, many of the unions practice it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, there are big uh, public relations firms in Washington that offer a semblance of it, you know, where they, you know, the, the, having people phone in, and even labor uses it, having lots of people phone in and putting pressure on a member of Congress, et cetera. It can all be automated. Uh, now, but the true grassroots is still bringing people together, bringing people together who maybe didn't even realize they had a common uh, commonalities until they come together. So, well, and actually, I mean, that's how I got involved in the process to begin with. Was in the, primarily in the 2006 election, I got involved with a, a candidate who really was out there. He was talking to individual voters. He the first uh, canvas I did, which is when you go out and knock on doors and talk to voters, the candidate actually showed up and he knew I was a first time volunteer, sat there and talked to me, to me about his campaign for about 20 minutes after the canvas was over. And that's, and really that, that kind of... Who was the candidate? It was Andy Hurst. Ah, Andy Hurst out here who ran in the, in the 11th uh, congressional district uh, in 2006. And did uh, very well with very little for money compared to all the money Tom Davis had. Uh, right. know, I'll, I'll always uh, have good things to say about his campaign and him as a person because he's a man of character. Right. And uh, he, he had a lot of success. He's, and I, I still keep in touch with him. He's a great guy. Um, and also that grassroots success really kind of helped Jim Webb, first of all, get into the race. And then eventually having so many volunteers out there knocking on doors, making phone calls. That's what I truly believe is what finally took him over the edge. And now that we have uh, the 2008 presidential elections coming on, this is where we're really seeing a lot of uh, grassroots organizing. Um, the Obama campaign actually is having house parties. Um, they, in, here in Virginia, that they're having them at least every week that I'm, I'm getting emails about certain things that they're doing in the neighborhood. They are, they're having tons and tons of offices opening up in, uh, throughout the, the, the Commonwealth. Uh, a couple weekends ago, they opened up an office in Centerville, which is where I'm from. And I was ecstatic because, you know, you don't, in, in prior elections, we don't really hear about Democrats doing much in Centerville. But the fact that they were out there and they're so involved in that grassroots process, mm -hmm that they, were, they know that if they're able to set up a lot of field offices, really go out there, send tons and tons of people out there knocking on doors, that their message is going to get out there and it's really going to be able, they'll be able to kick off enough storm to, to make some differences. And so now that that's working in the electoral pol politics, we also see it with organizations like Work and Families Win, where we're out kind of promoting certain issues and the more and more people we have getting excited about the issues, the more and more the local leaders and local officials are actually paying attention to what we're saying because they've seen the success 
that grassroots can have in their campaigns. And pretty soon, if there's like house parties every day, college kids can go to one every night and eat. <laughs> yes, every uh, night. We have uh, George from Fairfax on the phone for a follow-up. George, I like you. You're a real lefty. Okay. Um, I appreciate the comment. Um, but I noticed you were reflecting on an NPR survey you said about Switzerland. Yeah. Now, NPR, to use a Darth Vader expression, went to the dark side when George Bush threatened to cut their funding at the first term of his coup d'etat. But anyway, when you're discussing Switzerland, you have to realize that the per capita income is some of the highest in the world. I understand. That they have very low unemployment, that the population is elderly, and um, there are no ghettos in Switzerland, none. So, and their GNP, about 12% of their GNP is what it costs them for health care. In this country, we're at 16%. There is no other civilized country that's in the same percentage. And that's not factoring little things like anyone who lives near the Canadian border goes to Canada for their health care. So we are paying far higher premiums, whether it's direct or indirect, for our health care now. And um, the, the fundamental problem is the greed. And you saw that in particular in Maryland a few years ago when all the doctors were whining about um, health care insurance. What they didn't tell you was that 97% of the doctors in Maryland are self-insured. They pay a high malpractice premium, the return comes back as a dividend. Guess what? It's taxed at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. So it, this whole thing about health care discussion is a, a question of appeasement. But the fundamental problem is greed and apathy. In this country, when George Bush had his first coup d'etat, people didn't say anything. They let the Supreme Court do what they did. In even a little country like Ukraine, they Oh, no, was, who, was it Lukashenko who got in and the other I forget. But the point is here, there's so much apathy. This is what happens when you have that. If the, if the public here voted people who actually represented them as opposed to the politicians, there would be, you'd start to see the changes. But uh, I see the fundamental problem as the greed, the corporate greed in this, in this country. Uh, so. George, uh, I'm wondering, why would you like to see an organi uh, organization like Working Families win? What do you think we could do to, to go out there and really make a difference in, in, in this area? I, I appreciate the question. Healthcare is not my forte. But I did mention earlier that... Fooled it, me. <laughs> it's not, trust me. <laughs> um, but it did it, it, earlier. I, my, it seemed to me that the unions, if they provided more, like in Palestine with Hamas, they provide health care to the citizens. You'd think if the unions were interested in actually assisting and helping uh, the members, that they would not just organize an HMO, but the whole structure, the whole hospital routine medical care. Um, and then it, they could be referred to hospitals for surgery, etc. But the, And that's one of the things that scares a lot of people in this country, I think, is the fact that they know they don't have health insurance. It's going to cost them a lot of money when they go to see the doctor, and they're afraid of that bankruptcy. People die because of that all the time. Interesting stuff. Thank you for calling. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Shannon, you want to address this union health care thing? I, the, 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 the concept is wonderful. I just think, again, it's more complex in terms of attempting to execute something like that. I think that I had to go back to a previous comment where if you have a larger risk pool, you're going to be able to lower the cost and have it be just amongst our, our union members is a start. Um, I think that there's just a lot of other factors that would be better benefited by a universal plan um, to lower the cost for one, the administrative overhead for another. We're marching in the streets for weeks to get rid of uh, Lucas. Um, it's a much larger picture. You know, the other thing that uh, we haven't touched upon, but I've seen it, I was lucky enough, thanks to labor, that I had what, was, what is known as a defined <laughs> period of time, I knew I would get a minimum of X amount of dollars per month for the rest of my life. Well. We've seen the private sector, uh, with the encouragement of the Republicans, decimate that yeah. system in 
my lifetime and less than my lifetime. I mean, none of my children will have a defined benefits plan. They'll have defined contributions plans yeah. at best, which basically says, we'll throw in a little money, you throw in the rest, and you're responsible for negotiating the wiles of uh, high finance to make sure you have enough to retire. It's going to be a disaster in 25 and 30 years from But of now. course, you're going to be able to pass on hereditary wealth to future generations. Yeah. Why not invest everything <laughs> in the stock market? Sure. Uh, it's one thing that we're very, very proud to have as a defined benefit plan for our, our members because it, you tack on the, the wages, the health care, and the pension, you know, you have a, a solid contract and it uh, will carry you well into the future. Right. Um, actually, I know one, uh, one family where the mother is a Fairfax County teacher, and, and I know this based upon conversations I've had with them that she's looking into retiring in a couple of years. And one of the nice things that with that set number of years working, they're able to plan it out where their youngest son is going to be going through uh, college soon and so they'll be able to work it out where she's able to kind of retire after they've been able to make sure that their youngest son kind of mm -hmm. got through college is able to the kind of get out on his own yeah. and I think with that it, it really works because not only is that making their economic situation better but it also works better for their families you can just knowing that that's there that you can it, it, makes the family situation a whole lot better. And I know that in the long run that, that you would think that the Republicans would like that family values type of thing, but they don't necessarily think that, oh, if we help out their pocketbooks a little bit, it'll actually improve the family situation. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to have a benevolent employer to a degree Very much to so. have a good defined benefits plan. And uh, we're seeing far less and less loyalty of employers towards their employees, uh, resulting in less loyalty by employees mm -hmm. to their employers. Mm -hmm. We've run out of time. I want to thank Shannon and Brian for being on the show tonight. And uh, we will see you next week here on Inside Scoop Virginia. Good night.